Oh, there you are. <laughs> I was looking for you. All right. Join palm and bow. The four great vows. I vow to deliver innumerable sentient beings. I vow to cut off endless vexations. I vow to master limitless approaches to Dharma. I vow to attain supreme Buddhahood. Welcome to you all to our regular Monday night uh, uh, lecture. Um, some of you have been um, joining me in the Mind Work Forum um, on the Mighty Network, and uh, it's been very, very productive. And we'll go into that uh, in a little bit. Yeah, so you can begin to understand now what mind work is as opposed to just simply uh, um, uh, a study um, the the real essence of, of the contemplation. And this is where we start. Uh, Dao Xin had a lot uh, of um, of good material to pass on, and he was the first one that was in the anthologies uh, and compediums of, of the masters that they really concentrated on and provided uh, uh, more information with them um, in terms of, of what was there and, and directing towards mind. Um, and uh, I think that he, he wasn't necessarily the first in the patriarchs to do that. I think that went all the way back even before uh, Bodhidharma, but he was the one that really pegged it and 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 set it in in the right course with respect to how to meditate and that's why i'm um, spending more time with him because this was a very pivotal moment in terms of the the practice where he uh was beginning to come up with uh more more of the the information um and, and a more pr practice um, point. And I might've talked about this the last time, but I wanna start here um, from, from this. This is from the records of the patriarchs of the Lankavatara. And again, ref the reference back to the patriarchs of the Lankavatara is the homage to uh, Bodhidharma Dhammo, which um, uh, presented the Lankavatara and said, this has everything um, that you need in terms of, uh, of the practice. And, um, and so all of the Chan started uh, from their kind of a wellspring in terms of, of producing the, the, the concepts of Chan, or the concept of the practice aspect of, uh, of, of Buddhist uh, uh, I don't know you call it religion at that point, but it was something that might have been seen as a religion in Buddhism at that point. But there was this turning of the corner and saying it's not just this kind of a, um, a devotional practice. It is this practice that you have to have this individual aspect of it, that of, of looking into mind. And um, so this is the part that's difficult for us. And that's why I set up the Mind Work Forum to introduce people to the sincere and earnest practice of looking into mind, not just reading about mind or looking to me to give you an answer. Um, I probably give you less answers than slaps and questions uh, as we go along the way. But I think that that's, that's what you need in terms of that. And we'll go back to that again a little bit later. But he started with this and he said, we must constantly rest all our efforts um, of body and mind on the place of the way. Our actions are Bodhi. There is no Buddha apart from mind and no mind apart from the Buddha. Resting, um, oh, excuse me, reciting the name of the Buddha is reciting the mind. Seeking the mind is seeking the Buddha. If you know the principle that consciousness is without identity and Buddha is without form, and also Buddha has no image, your mind will be at rest. And this is really important to us because of the fact that there's so many people that as we practice, they, they don't get that. And as a result of it, 
you're constantly trying to identify what mind is or identify what mind is not. And, and so instead of using contemplation, you're still using cogitation. And then every once in a while, one of you will get an epiphany, you'll get some kind of an insight into it. And, and you just bump right into mind, but in, instead of bumping into it like a, um, like a door, you just fall right into it um, because it's naturally there. And you realize, wait, there shouldn't there be a door here? Shouldn't there be something? But there's nothing there because in that moment, the idea of a life and being, an ego or personality is sincerely abandoned. Not just that you say, okay, I, I don't exist. Well, you scratch your head and say, but I felt that. So I must still exist. It is the sincerity of the contemplation of the probing that gets you there. And so what Tao Xin is saying is almost circular. Mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind. And you go, okay. And so you say, what is it? Mind is Buddha, Buddha is mind. There's just one mind. Well, but then when I stick a fork in you, you, you still are not done. And matter of fact, a lot of times you start squealing. Um, and the thing is, is for sure you're not done. Okay. Um, but the thing is, is that some of you get used to it. Like uh, my, my parrot friend that, that, you know, he, he, he likes getting stuck with a fork. But, but in any case, it, it's, it's not bad. I mean, the thing is, is that some of you may think, oh, well, Gilbert, he just likes to be a trickster. He likes to play games. No, I don't. This is a serious matter. It's a matter of life and death. It's very, very serious to me. And, and everything that I do and say, sometimes I, I let my sense of humor go and put in double and tendres, but they're intended. They're intended to be that way. And so when when you see things, it's there to, for you to, to work on. And sometimes the actual meaning of my comments to you are not what appears to be. There is a secondary, sometimes a tertiary meaning to what I'm saying, but it's there for you to kind of keep looking, try, trying to dig um, to find those, those embers that are still glowing there. And, and to see what, what's there. And, and this is an important part because it's difficult for us because we feel that there's a demarcation point between the idea of the self and consciousness and mind, something that we, we have to pass through. And even stylized, you know, some of the ancient masters say you're bucking it into the iron wall or the mountain the, the two iron mountains that you're stuck between. And so you think that there's something there. But then again, they corrected that by saying there was a gateless gate. So saying, is there a way to pass through? Yes, but no. It's, there's a gate there, but there's not really, it's, it's gateless. And you go, what does that mean? It doesn't mean anything actually think about it, a gateless gate, you know, where would you find that? But when we, we probe, we have to probe with the sincerity of mind. And this is the part that's very, very important for us to be able to, to really um, practice in a way that we don't realize an understanding of something. Um, that's still on the sentient side. We don't throw out the sentience. And that's the thing that I was playing with people over the weekend and last weekend as well. You're not throwing out the sentient to get to the other. You're seeing it as it is. So you do not have to, to, make any movements, any commitments to get rid of yourself. You just have to see clearly what is appearing and where is appearing at. 
why it's appearing. And we are constantly visiting this, seeing this in a manner in which we, we can look at it and see, okay, this is how, how it works. It's not easy for us to, to, to do that. But in mind work, when you sit to meditate, you're precisely doing that. You are just simply sitting. There is no you. There's, if cogitation arises, you don't have to throw it out. You just have to be aware of it. And as you become more and more aware of the cogitation, the mind engages in contemplation. Again, this is, is contemplation is not the contemplation of a sequential thinking or solution to some kind of a problem. Contemplation is just simply resting the mind in the present moment, letting it be aware of everything, but not attaching to anything. This is the difficult part for us because when we sit to meditate, we begin to attach to the images that arise in the mind and then boom, we're off, you know, back into the dream. But this very mind that you're using, this very mind that you sit to meditate with, it's pure. You just have to let it rest. And by not resting, it doesn't kick up the dust. Remember when you were little kids and you'd go in, into on a hot summer day and you'd be in a dirt field and you'd shuffle your feet, right? And it, I don't know if you ever did that. If you didn't, you too bad you guys lived, you know, didn't have a good childhood. But anyway, I, it was all fine and dandy until I went home. My mom would say, look at your shoes. But, but in any case, you're there and there's a cloud of dust and you purposely make this cloud of dust all around you. It's like, oh, look, it's, it's smoking, it's smoking, you know. And, um, but when you stop shuffling, the dust just goes down. So the trick is when we meditate is we don't shuffle. We don't shuffle. We're there and we can be in, in a field and we're aware of everything, but we don't have to make it obscure. By, by not reaching for e everything, we hold everything, um, but not hold it in the way that human sentient beings want to hold something or hold it in their mind. To hold something with mind is to, to let it go. It's there. We have to trust and have faith in mind that we don't have to concentrate on this particular item. Mind will properly set it in, in where it should be in terms of um, appearances within consciousness. Um, if we're there and it's a hot day, we don't have to be dwelling on that it's a hot day. We know it's a hot day. It's a dusty day. It's a noisy day, a quiet day, whatever it is. But we don't have to judge any of those things. They're just naturally occurring. And when we sit to meditate and we just allow everything to naturally occur, there's liberation there. And the liberation comes from not holding on to anything that's, that's transitory, that's coming up. Now, of course, if we're working or if we need to resolve a problem or whatever, we can think about the problem and we can go through the process and we follow the function of doing that. But as we're thinking of solving a problem, we should not let fears arise or, or other emotions arise uh, that are coming up or be lured to do something else. We stay on task. We follow that function and we just go that way. It, it allows the mind to rest all the time. And so when we, we meditate and we meditate in the proper way, what happens is, is that we have um, uh, a, a resting of the mind. It just is just there. And the mind then will do two things. One, it will certify in the samsaric realm that you're doing it right and that it's working. 
And the other is it opens the gate where the, where the samsaric realm consciousness cannot enter. But this gate that opens is just really the absorption of all that's happening in that present moment into mind because it's already there. It's already absorbed. We just don't see that because we created this, um, this dream that kind of encapsulates a portion of mind that we cannot fathom the way out of it. And so what we do is we are constantly trying to find the means to escape. Where are we going to go? Even if we tried to escape, where would we go? And can you imagine if you were a dream on the loose in mind? What you could do or what harm could come? because of your ignorance but isn't that why we want to practice and lead others to practice so that the harm in mind like that does not happen the ignorance the greed the hatred all the things that breed um, desires and hatred and war all these things come up because we cling to this dream so we're this this dream, and sometimes maybe we shouldn't call it a dream because a dream sounds more um, stylistically like calm, but it's more like a nightmare a lot of times. And what we, we do in, in the dream, we cause suffering. It's not easy for us to, to to understand that, to say, we deliver these sentient beings of an illusory nature. Well, well, wait a minute, then what the heck are we delivering there? We cannot understand that. We cannot, we cannot get to that this is not a contradiction. It sounds like a contradiction, delivering sentient beings of an illusory nature. And you say, well, how, how can that be? No, it either is or it isn't. And it is this duality that belongs to samsara that obstructs our understanding or our realization of mind. We cannot see things clearly because we feel either you're in it or you're out of it, but you can't be both. And you'd say, but you can't be both. And I would say precisely, but you can't be either what, what? And you can't be neither of them. What? And this is like the tetralemma. That we, we don't understand that. We don't know how to, to overcome that. And so as a result of that, all of these incredible wealth of dharma that we receive, we only get a little bit of it. And then one day, we have some realizations and all of a sudden we see layers upon layers of information in the sutras that we're studying. We never saw it before. And there is a joy, a Dharma joy that comes from seeing that, to seeing oh, that how you understand this and you can see, yes, if you cling to it too long, it will mess mess you up but if you just let it be in the present moment let mind materialize naturally then it works but it takes your faith to be able to do that and your faith to be able to put down concepts a course 
on the samsaric side, we still have to, to practice. We still have to study. We cannot just simply throw everything out. So sometimes when I'm in the mind works, people will say, oh, you know, I am getting this, I'm getting that, and say, no, you're still in it. And others will say, nothing. There's nothing there. Well, then they threw the baby out with the bathwater. They, they now threw out everything and holding on to non-existence and thinking that this is mine. But mine is so subtle. It's so very subtle in the way in which it, it uh, works. It's neither is nor neither isn't that this suchness there is a suchness beyond concept and it's a suchness that is not limited to sunyata or or emptiness if we see emptiness in this way then it is not right not easy for us to do that. But if it was different, let's say that, that we're just all a dream. Then we could just simply wake up from the dream, say adios to everything, and join mind. And just say, so long, suckers. Bye-bye, you're just a dream, so you don't count. But yet they're suffering. A lot of suffering. The suffering starts the moment somebody is born. When someone is dying. Because it's a dream, does that mean that we turn a deaf ear to it? No. That's precisely the why Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, Guan Shi Pusa, is there to, to say that the suffering of the world is hurt. There is an interest in that. We cannot see that from the viewpoint just simply as um, a caring. We have to see it much deeper than that as a function of mind, the nature of mind. And this was an incredible shift in the practice when the uh, Prajnaparamita Sutras came into, into being and then ultimately came to China and people were reading and all of a sudden going, wait a second, this Heart Sutra uh, this is, is really something. And imagine if you only had one tune you could play. You'd get pretty good at playing the tune. And, and so people would look into that and look into that and see that, that this is the heart of the practice. And, and it is this compassion that separates out in terms of the practice. It is not the compassion of a Buddha. It is the compassion of the self nature of mind. We don't separate out and say Buddhas have this kind of compassion. We have to straddle the two from samsara to mind so that we're able to carry out the function of mind in samsara. Otherwise, we could not do that. When I say we, who am I talking about? Not you as an individual, but you as a representative of mind. This mind that you're using, the mind that I'm using, the mind that Robert's using, Debbie, Cheryl, Michael, Mark, all of you, it's not separate. There's no name to it. It is just thus. It's hard for us to understand that because we are been so stuck in samsara for so long, we don't understand that. 
And so it's difficult for us to do that. When I am responding to people on mind work, I'm pointing towards the mind and pointing towards little um, errors that are still there to, for people to look at and to, to contemplate. This is how we do that. We have to learn proper contemplation. This contemplation is just simply letting the mind rest. We're not good at that. We're not good at the most natural and easiest thing to do. Let the mind rest. Some of you are good at sleeping. But when you sleep, is your mind at rest? Or is it constantly conjuring up images and thoughts and things that, that are happening? And it's not really at rest. So when we are aware of the dream and the appearances or so-called appearances in mind, then, and we don't take them to be separate and we don't take them to be happening to an individual life and being, then we can do work. Now, to the people that we communicate with, for sure, they know that this, uh, these things to them, they take them to be real. So we cannot just simply say to people, oh, you don't exist, you're not real. You can begin to talk to them about a dream and the dream world, but it's not easy for people to fathom that. I mean, some of you, I, I can present it, and if you have deep roots, you pick it up very quickly. Others, you are sincere in your practice, and then you pick it up quickly. Others, they come with, they always talking about the shravakas, those that, that are the sound hearers, and you hear it, and you begin to pick it up, but you're still not picking up contemplation. You're still not practicing it. So you have the, the, the basic foundation of the practice, but have not put it into, into work. And, and that is what Dao Xin was, was uh, imploring people to do, is, is to put it into work. So I'll go back to him for a second. If you recall the last time I talked, I said that we must identify with the natural rhythm of things, or that's what he said. And so we have to say, what's this natural rhythm of things? And it's just pratika samapada, how mind works. So the natural rhythms of things, it, it's as easy as saying that you plant a melon seed, you get a melon fruit. And so you see the things in this way, the natural rhythms. And so you understand that. Sometimes it can be a, um, a cacophony of sounds of, of discord. And other times it can be this melodic music that that that's happening and, and that you are tuning to and hoping others will tune to it as well. And then um, this last week I, or, or two weeks ago, I just I, I I thought this was very profound of what he said. He says, if you have the view that beings in samsara and I am able to save them. And these beings are incapable, are, are capable of being saved. Then you are not to be called the bodhisattva. Saving beings is similar to saving the empty sky. How could the sky ever uh, come or gone? This is very, very profound because we still make a vow to deliver sentient beings, but we should always say when we make the vow to deliver sentient beings is that they're illusory. We understand that. So a bodhisattva functioning properly understands that these sentient beings are, are illusory by the very nature that they belong to the self-nature of mind. This is important because this is the liberation of a saint. 
this understanding to see things in this way, the clarity of it, but it does not interfere with our efforts to deliver these illusory sentient beings. And uh, over the weekend and listening to you and, and reading your comments and my own contemplation, I began to, to realize a little bit more that in terms of this, uh, because some people would say, if nothing exists, if everything's a dream, why do we even bother? I mean, why do we even bother practicing, much less saving other sentient beings? And it is important because that was what the Heart Sutra was all about. It wasn't just simply saying that there was an emptiness there. Within that emptiness, and the bodhisattvas delivering innumerable sentient beings is the understanding that there's an emptiness there, but it's not the emptiness of, of vacuous space. There's nothing there. It is the emptiness in terms of that everything belongs to mind. And it would be you looking at your finger and seeing that you have a splinter in your finger and just going, well, it doesn't it doesn't belong to any of the other fingers, so I'll just leave it there. It would still bother you every time this finger was utilized, there would be a sensation there uh, of discomfort. And so the body, the Dharma nature, wants to remove that kind of an unsettling type of an experience. And so it does that. But it's not easy for us to understand this, the, the Dharmakaya, in the sense of a realization or a, uh, when I say realization, is something that um, mind experienced uh, out, I hate to say outside of samsara, but beyond the, the limitations of samsara. So it's hard for us to, to make that jump like that, but we have to see it in this way. That's why we practice. We practice and we, we practice and we set the table with all of these principles of emptiness, impermanence, no self, no suffering. All of these things we set the table with. We begin to, to uh, look at the world from a different viewpoint. Instead of looking at it from, how is it going for myself? We looking at it from causes and conditions and why things are appearing. Not why are they appearing to you, but why they're appearing. And as we begin to practice in this way, what happens is that we open the, the mind to mind. And there is uh, an absorption. This absorption can be a sudden absorption and a very profound absorption, or it can be a very um, uh, um, short duration or long duration, but it could be something that we don't even sense. We don't even know that, that there's been this transition towards mind simply because the self is not there to cash in the chips. So this is interesting because what I'm trying to do is say to you something that's beyond the words and phrases, but to explain to you why you practice, that you have to practice. And you say, well, if, if everything is mine and I don't really exist, then why should I practice? I mean, I'm just a dreamer, an illusion anyway. And so then you proceed on looking for mine. Where is mine? Where is mine? This is a dream. So when I wake up, then what is mine going to feel like? It doesn't feel like anything. Even if you wake up from mine as you are in the sentient world, you'll still be in the sentient world. Causes and conditions never change. The only difference is that you know that you're in the sentient world. But you 
are operating with the use of mind and not this idea of egocentrism or ego uh, self-conceit or self-love. And it's different. So you are there, you are in the dream. You still have to function most of the time with the rules of, of, of this world. You know, if you jump up, you're going to come down. You're not going to be a superhero, you know, and be able to jump up and fly around just simply because you know that this is a dream. But you still can do some very amazing things. Um, just think of what Master Shen Yang did in the short time that he was here. It's amazing. And so, so uh, we see the world from a, a different viewpoint. Okay. That's it. I was going to come back to it. Let's see. So the Diamond Sutra says, as for an infinite number of beings who have been saved, in fact, there are no beings who have been saved. As a whole, bodhisattvas of the first stage at the beginning have a realization that all things are empty. Later on, they obtain the realization that all things are not empty, which is identical to the wisdom of non-discrimination. The Heart Sutra says form is identical to emptiness. It is not because form is eliminated and then there is emptiness. The nature of form is emptiness. This, we go by so quickly. We never get it. We never get it. It's right there, right in the Heart Sutra, and we never get it. We go, form is not an emptiness. Emptiness is not in form. Form is precisely emptiness. And then you go on to the next, oh, wait a minute, slow down, slow down. You missed it. You missed it. Are you going to wait till the next lifetime to try to see it again? Or maybe you just slow down and take a look at this and, and then see this. You see this from your heart. And then you see, forget about calling it empty. Just call it mind. And it might work better. In this way. All bodhisattvas think that studying emptiness is identical to enlightenment. Those who have just begun the practice, Buddhists immediately understand emptiness, but the only um, view of emptiness and it's not true emptiness. Those who obtain true emptiness through cultivating the way do not see either emptiness nor non-emptiness through uh, cultivating the way, or do not see, uh, they, do, they do not have any views at all. You should by all means thoroughly understand the idea that form is emptiness, the activity of the mind of those who are really proficient in emptiness will definitely be lucid and pure. And here, the key words is the activity of the mind. So it is not something that comes with a book learning understanding. It is the absorption in the present moment of mind being absorbed by mind. And when it is in this way, it neither is nor is not. It, it becomes irrelevant because it is just simply this emptiness means that it is devoid of anything separate from mind. That's all it means. It means that everything there, everything you look, wherever you see is mind. It's occurring perfectly. When you are awakened to the fundamental nature of things, when you completely understand and are clearly discerning, then later on you yourselves will be considered masters. Furthermore, inner thoughts and outward behavior must coincide and there must be no disparity between truth and practice. You should sever relationships with written work and spoken explanations. In pursuing the sacred way towards enlightenment, by staying alone in a place of tranquility, 
you can realize by yourself attainment of the way. Now, this statement is very often misunderstood. And during that time period, it was also misunderstood that one should not study. And there was actually some factions, some small factions that would say, we don't study because, uh, you know, the studying leads to nothing. It is not in this way. It is in the understanding via mind that, that mind is beyond concept. So all of the training, all of the study leads us to the finger tip pointing at mind. And if it really should be a fingertip that pointing in every direction as mind. And so it misunderstood when we say, oh, we have to throw all of this out. We need it. You need to hear this. You need to hear the sutras and the lectures and everything. But then you have to put it into practice. You, you have to make it your practice, your realization. But if you practice in a way where you're going, I'm doing this and, and in this right here, I know there's going to be a realization. It doesn't work in that way. You'll just bounce off the, the face of the page. And worse yet, you may think that, that you have gotten something from the writings. The writings, when done properly, and when you're studying, don't interfere. They don't get in the way. They, they essentially open up and allow you to go beyond the page itself. When you practice in this way with this type of a spirit, then the, um, the way is always before you. No matter where you step, where you look, what you think, it's always there. But if you're trying to dig some kind of wisdom, lift it off the page, or having it pour through your ears and, and hoping that there will be something that will make you enlightened, it won't work that way. You have to really practice sincerely. The thing is, is you are now at a point that you're so close, all of you just simply listening to right view. You're so close. Not too many people have an opportunity to listen to right view, to listen and say, here we are. Just, you just have to do this and, and it will be there. You have to have faith. Just let go. Whenever the mind wants to pick up something and bring it to the center of the attention of the mind, but it at that point has no function, then the mind is in a dream. If you're sitting there and meditating and wondering what's going to be for lunch or what you're going to do tomorrow or what you're going to wear tomorrow or what was said earlier in the day, then you you are not in the present moment. You are in a dream. You have to use the mind's own discernment. And this discernment is not um, dual. It is not subject and object. It is just simply that when you sit to meditate and you have no thought as you're sitting there, now, that may be one second, five seconds. It could be a minute before a thought arises in mind. But the discernment is the, the awareness in mind that the mind has now become bound to some thought there in mind. And the clarity of the mind has now become diminished you see you start with all the chips and then, then it's like going
going to Las Vegas and you have a big stack of chips. And every time you cling to a thought, you lose a chip, you lose a chip, you lose a chip. As you're losing the chips, you lose clarity. When you return back and stay to the present moment, then the chips start packing up again. And, and this is the habitual nature of things is as you begin to do the meditation in the proper way, the chips, st the chips stack up. You are learning how not to think. Practicing. If you need to think, you could think, but when you're meditating, you don't need to think. Except for somebody that falls asleep and falls over, I've never seen anybody fall off their cushion. So you just are there. You're meditating. And you're just there in the present moment. And the you falls off. It's just mind in the present moment. Thoughts come up like raiders and they'll raid and, and they'll they'll dazzle you and take you away. My vacation, my grandchildren, no, whatever it is that that lures you, you know, my animals. And there's more and more people with animals than grandchildren these days. Um, but in any case, you whatever clings to you and then in that moment what we don't understand what we can't see is that the clarity of the mind has become diminished and we cannot see re-entering a dream state we confuse the dream state with our life and so we don't see it that way when we are aware we are in the dream, then we have the free will to do whatever needs to be done in the dream. We're not subject to um, zombies chasing us or a monster chasing us or whatever it is. Uh, we are clear. We're aware we're in the dream. And so when we wake up, it's the same thing. We're aware that this is a dream. We're aware of, of what we need to say, what we need to do, um, and, um, and what we need to think. So when we meditate, and we meditate in the proper way, what do we need to think? Stay on the method. Stay on the method. It is not really a thought. It is just simply you staying on the method. Master Shen Ying used to say, to stay on the method, the thought of staying on the method is not a thought. It is like a giant bullfrog sitting on a lily pad. And the frog is so big and fat, he covers the entire lily pad so that one um, sees that there's... Um, um, this thought, but the thought is not sequential, it is just a repetitiveness there. That's what you do with your method. You don't have to say that was a good Amitofo. That Amitofo was too long or too short or whatever, whatever method you're on, when you're, who's reciting the Buddha's name, you know, you, you don't have to grade it. You just are doing it, you're aware. And it is that adherence to the method, irregardless of which method you're using, that clarifies the mind. It is in this way. We don't get this training. We don't really begin to see that clearly. If we see it from this and we understand that we start with mind and we lose it along the way. The big question is, how long does it take you to be completely off your method? Five minutes? One minute? So imagine, 
imagine if you could stay on your method for 30 minutes. I mean, really, really stay on your method for 30 minutes. You know what would happen to you? You would have a class telling people that they can do it. And you'd be able to tell them that. It is possible, but you, you have to do it. I cannot be there with you to have you make this kind of an effort, this supreme effort. But my goodness, I mean, think about this. If somebody said to you, you know, if you practice acting for, for 30 minutes, just complete sincere acting for 30 minutes, you could get an Academy Award. What? Serious. I promise you, if you did this for 30 minutes, you could get an Academy Award. You'd be that good of an actor or actress. And you go, really? I guarantee it. You'd go, that's worth it. I'm going to do that. I want an Academy Award. Not as a supporting actor. No, no. The main actress. You can get that one. I'll do it. But then, you know, um, you'll still be there, like the Dame Judy Dench, you know, she's like, I don't know how old she is, but she's still there, I mean, and striving to get more Academy Awards. But all you have to do is do this once. Stay with no thought for 30 minutes. Meditating. You won't have to worry about an Academy Award. My gosh, you know, what you will realize is beyond any kind of a samsaric value. Heck, better than a golden globe or whatever else you have, a Grammy, they just had Grammys. So the thing is, is, is that you, if, if you practice it's priceless. It's absolutely priceless. If it wasn't, I wouldn't be wasting my time talking to you. Some of you have already gotten peaks. And that's why you're here. Is that you've gotten a peak. Some of you don't even know that you've gotten a peak. But it's not the, the well-known advisor's job to tell you, okay, you've got the, the golden ticket or whatever. Because then you'll start walking around going, I got the golden ticket. But it's not that way. It, it is the way that you just keep practicing and practicing and practicing. And you, and you, uh, you work it in this way. You're not worried about whether you get it or you don't. But you practice sincerely. This is the utmost aspect of it when you're meditating. Don't throw it away, Mike. Gosh, don't throw it away. What are you doing when you're sitting on the cushion? You know, you, you spend all the time listening to me and I'm telling you how to do it. And then you go there and you start thinking about tomorrow or yesterday or whatever, or that your feet hurt, you know, or, um, you know, whatever it is that, that bothers you. Let it go. Be sincere. You have to hold the method. How do you hold a method? By doing nothing. By thinking nothing. We think that we have to think. Therefore, we think. How about it if you didn't have to think? Would you be afraid that you couldn't think? It it isn't in this way. Let me read to you, and we'll keep going back to Dao Xin, but um, this was a question that I had saying um, to my group in, uh, on mind work, and it said, awakening from the dream, what happens to the sentient being? So if you awaken from the dream, what happens to the sentient being? 
And there was all sorts, actually there was like almost 50 comments on this one. So it was a pretty good, pretty good response of, of people. You know, some of them were, were doing all, you know, uh, going through it and then coming back for, a, for another, um, another try at it. And, and so then I had asked also, hold on, let me see. Some, some, so I'd said, uh, awakening from the dream, what happens to the sentient being? And someone wrote, become a light for others. So I said, to please explain. And they said, so that they will be able to uh, awaken too. Um, and then someone said, nothing to be attained in awakening. Uh, another person said, since in, pa in the path of awakening, no doubt will fall back into slumberland frequently, if not immediately, but in the moment of a billionth of a lightning, a rare glimpse of liberation from the shackle of ignorance, one is, one is still the sentient, but faith in the path uh, grew deeper and stronger. And so it says, uh, go buy, uh, buy a broom and start sweeping. And this uh, comment um, um, is, is a good comment, but I commented to them, well, my five feathered friend, um, how does one stay awake? So, so if you're there, then how do you stay awake? And, uh, and somebody said, the sentient being wasn't there to begin with. And I respond, does a sentient being possess the Buddha mind or does the mind possess the sentient being? Which one do you think? Does the sentient being possess the Buddha mind or does the mind possess the sentient being? And somebody said the latter. And I said, then as you read this, who is reading? And somebody responds, mind is. Um, is the sentient being still there? So this is important because is the sentient being still there? If one has a realization, is the sentient being still there? What do you think? It's interesting. It's not as easy as you think it is because you say, oh, no, they, the sentient being ceases to function. Is it really that way? This is, this is not so easy to come up with the solutions to it. And so somebody says, wasn't there to begin with. So um, then... Um, Hold on, let me move a little bit further down. Does the mind sleep? So does the mind ever sleep? What do you think? See, these are not so easy. It looks like, oh yeah, well, the mind never sleeps. Like I think there was a song called Rust Never Sleeps. Does the mind ever sleep? And, um, and then somebody says, the sentient being dies really dies is there no hope so is there no hope for a sentient being um there is no being or sensing to be done that that's the hope isn't it then what then there is mind and body so the person's working through it and they're seeing okay there's mind but then there's bodies so how am i going to say that um and and I said, would that be anything? And they say, perhaps a glass without stains. So I say, a diamond? Is that, and then the person says, is that still not the dream? Um, and they answer themselves. So anyway, perhaps then the tea will have been drunk, no glass, no diamond. Someone else comes in and says, the dream is appearance of mind. It is part of mind. And um, my parrot friend comes back in and says, does mind sleep? Just one dusty pocket of it does uh, where the self called being likes to be remembered as. And while all of it uh, don't and never sleep. So he kind of fudged it there and said, yes and no. And so then to, 
so I responded to one and said, so the dream is an appearance of mine and is not an appearance in mine. Is there a difference? So if a dream is an appearance of mine and is not appearance in mine, is there a difference between of mine and in mine? And again, the answer here is not necessarily yes or no. It is for people to begin to look and to analyze from the sentient side, mind, and, and trying to, to extend beyond words and phrases and use contemplation to, to derive a better understanding of the question and the possible answer. And, um, and then the one that said a dusty pocket of doughs, I used a double intendre there saying, oh dear, where are the males? Uh, you know, Joe, Joe Dofu, um, what a smell. Never sleep, Joe Dofu is like a stinky tofu. So I'm saying he's like smelling up the place with his, uh, his comment. Uh, then who is awakened? I'll give you an A for effort and courage, but after the finger is lost, what will you use then? You have nine more tries. That's one more than the cat. The cat has 10 lives. Unless it is Michael's cat, then all is already lost. So Michael would, would be looking at Schrodinger's cat um, and whether the cat's alive or, or dead, but if he's out of the box and he's, he's dead already. So then um, Robert, the, the parrot says, he's getting dizzy. But that's the whole point is, is, is trying to work at this and say, let's take a look at this. Look at it from this point of view, this point of view. Don't, don't give the mind a place to rest, the, this consciousness that, that, that is trying to solve this. And then it said, um, let me move a little bit further down. So Santa said, awakening from the dream, the sentient being is recognized as a dream. Figure ground reversal. Recognition of not just the previous dream bound, but all dream bounds. Compassion, following function, wu wei, coursing the deep prashna paramita. So these are things that are coming up in her mind uh, related to that and and she's trying to process all of that as it goes along so i said ah santa took the safe ground here there is a maturation she's almost as bright as the lamppost keep this up and it will be the end of her meaning it there will not be a santa there and and then uh i think patricia had said something up here no difference just mine and I indicated to her the past has been cleared of the winter snow. Go this way and smell the plum blossoms, meaning that she's working towards the right thing. So if she keeps going that way, it will help her. But she has to, to really keep going. You can't just simply rest on your laurels and say, yeah, I got it, you know, because the next moment I might slap her back again. Um, and then Liang Shaolin, is Liang Shaolin here today? I don't know. Uh, but said this, I can't give the right answer. Whenever I say or think something, I is there. And I doesn't know how to say something that doesn't come from I. This is profound to this person because they start realizing this whole thing is a trap. It's a trap to catch the eye. And so they start realizing the only way to play the game is to not play it. You know, in terms of, of trying to come up with an answer, we can still respond to it and stuff, but they're starting to realize that the eye doesn't, can't get it. So then I said, there you go. So that's a double intendre saying, you know, that's, you know, you made a good point, but also there you, the I goes, is gone. An awakened sentient being is necessary for a complete awakening. This is the key. One is still conceptual, and the other 
awakening is beyond words and phrases. So this is my lesson for the day is you still have to have this awakened sentient being. You still need that from this side in order to, to go through the, the gateless gate, you know, beyond the words and phrases. So I'll, I'll stop there. But what I wanted to do is give you an idea of what, what I'm doing with mind work and, and, and really welcome you to participate in it because it's a process. And the people who have done this and gone through the process, you know, um, I would point to, for instance, Robert, who sincerely processed this when he didn't know, you know, um, anything about anything. And he, he really made great progress just simply by pursuing this, asking his so-called stupid questions, getting his stupid slapbacks, but it paid off. It paid off, you know, um, he's not just a parrot, but he might be an awakened parrot, but you know, he's still a parrot. Uh, but in any case, there, I just use him as an example, but there's many of you who ask the questions. And some of you are in the beginning point of asking these questions. And others have been doing this for a while. You know, Rick chimed in and talked about function, which was essentially what um, was being said uh, by Dao Xin in this is, is we were following function. And we didn't get to that part where he's talking about points of, of practice, but one of them was just to follow function in the present moment. So these are things that are important for us to understand how to practice. And if you practice in this way, if you sit and meditate in this way, it will happen. You, it cannot not happen, okay? Um, it, it will happen just simply because cause and condition never fails but you have to be very sincere about it. And you have to just do that. If you're there and you're battling through it, you know, you, you have to, to get through it and it will work, okay? So in any case, that's kind of um, my lecture for, for the night. And I'll take some questions. Thank you for listening. No questions today. Okay, we've got two coming up. David up first. Unmute yourself. Okay, thank you, uh, of course, for the uh, talk and everything. Um, I believe you were telling me exactly how to practice, um, especially about contemplation. Um, what I wanted to ask, um, you mentioned, of course, the Heart Sutra, and I'm starting to read that, um, what Master Shen Yan wrote and um, his commentary. And the question I had, you probably answered this um, earlier, but um, I'll just ask this. Um, you mentioned that emptiness, that everything belongs to mind. Um, so could you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well. There's nothing outside of mind. Everything that appears, everything that it appears on is mind. There, there is nothing independent of mind. If you try to even think of the horns of a hare or the hair of a tortoise, something that's non-existent, it's still in mind in the moment that you conceptualize it, it's there. And so when we see this, this is a big key, David, to be able to, to look at things and see everything is mine. Everything is um, in accordance with Pratika Samapada causes and conditions. And so when we see this, then we see that um, an explanation of what is appearing, but it also is the faith that whatever is appearing can change and the splinter can come off of the finger. Okay. So 
Other than that, don't think too much more about it. Okay. Okay. Jing Meyer. Hi, Gilbert. Hello. Um, you mentioned about, you talking about um, doing meditation and just stay with your methods throughout the time you, you are meditating. So um, if for like repeatedly doing body scan, does that count as a stay with the methods? Oh yeah, no. <laughs> No, 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 no. That's just you twiddling your thumbs and patting your head at the same time. Don't do that. Don't. Shifu, he used to say there was one of his students that that um, that said, oh, when, when I'm doing this, I could see inside my body and I could see that I have a problem with this organ and a problem with this other organ. And Shifu said, that's not the practice. He says, if you're sick, go to the doctor. Otherwise, stay on your method. Your so method do you, I never taught the method of body scan. Uh, right? Yeah, no, that's why yeah, you are know, talking about about it because uh, I um I was joining some other groups doing meditation and uh, a lot of time at the beginning uh, by relaxing relaxation they will do like uh, just relaxing your head, your your skin of your head, your eyes, your just by like a relaxing your whole head, your your chest, your just like a start starting from the top of your head, gradually relaxing all the way down to the bottom of your, your feet. So is that considered a method? No, no, it it is an inducement. Um, in Qigong. There's similar types of practices. And in fact, I use a Qigong modified one to, to do that same kind of a thing, sometimes in retreats, just to help people do that. But it's the same as in Tai Chi, as you bring your hands up like this and you come down, that's an inducement. It, it is before the movements, you're inducing the mind to take a rest, okay? But it's not that you do that all the time. Okay, you, it isn't something in that way. It is just inducing the mind to settle down. Once that exercise is finished, then your true practice begins, which is the, the meditation on your method. Okay, so there's no problem in, in starting that way. You just don't do that all the time. Okay, so I'm, I'm very happy you asked that question because it's important that you right from the very beginning, after you do your inducement and you relax and everything, you get right to it, okay? And you just put that aside. Okay, good question. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Any other questions? Michael. Yeah, so I have a similar question. Um, when it comes to silent illumination, uh, well, this is a bit tricky because it's it's a method of no method. So how do you know you are of the method? So, and uh, would it be correct to just uh, state it as resting in the present moment? Well, the mind rests in the present moment, uh, but what you equate to be resting and what mind of equates to be resting could be different i mean to you it might be sleeping in the present moment um the thing is 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 that your question is a really good one right now so the people who are doing sound illumination please pay attention um to this because in the side illumination we think it's doing nothing there's no method there so 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 there's nothing to do but it isn't in that way what it is, is, is that it's, you're not driving a Tesla, okay, and the car is going by itself. You have to keep it, your car on the road, okay? So if you drive the Tesla, you'll fall asleep and then you'll hit a wall someday, or, but, that, but it's not going to work in the right way. When you're on sun illumination, you do have something to do which is to stay in the present moment and be aware in the present moment. It is not sun illumination and silent dreaming. It is that you are in the present moment and you're simply just sitting. That's why the, the Chinese say mo chao, you know, you're just sitting. So 
what else are you doing? Nothing. You are on the method just sitting. So if you're there, you're like a bullfrog just sitting on the lily pad but you've had a full meal. You don't have to chase flies. You don't have to chase uh, lady frogs or whatever they're called. Uh, you're just sitting there just serenely, silently and serenely. And you're just resting the mind. We don't have to rest the mind by going, oh, let me make it go sleep. You just have to stay there by doing nothing. Okay. You're just simply there. You are not in the equation. Michael is not there. It is mind sitting. Remember that. Remember that, Michael. You are not there. If you shine the light on your ego, that is not uh, sun illumination. The illumination is shining on the propensity of the, um, the habitual tendencies of wanting to bring Michael to the forefront. So Michael's saying, I'm just sitting here. I'm very comfortable sitting here. I'm resting. No, you don't have to say that. <laughs> Send them away. Just sit. Just remember, it just means just sitting. Silent illumination. Silent means that it's not attaching to anything, but everything around it is illuminated. Meaning that any thought arising in the mind, the mind knows about it, but it doesn't chase after it or doesn't chase it away. It is just seeing the stuff coming up like bubbles, effervescent bubbles coming up. Let them go, let them go, let them go. It's natural. You're looking right into mind. Really, you're looking right into mind. You're seeing these things happening. You don't distinguish and say, this is a dream and this is a dream and this is a dream. Irregardless of whether it's a dream or not a dream, it is mine. We don't have to give it a name. We just see this is how mind works. Now go back and try it again. I guarantee you it's going to make a difference. I guarantee you. You know, because you're practicing from the samsaric side. Don't do that. It will make your mind so much clearer by doing this. So I'm really happy that you, you made this because I know a lot of people make the same mistake. Okay. And it's just a subtlety, subtle difference of right view. Okay. So go for it. No other question with that? I guess not. Ling Yun, there you are. Oh, I even see you now, kind of in a shadow. <laughs> oh, probably because of the light. There you go, kind of. It's, uh, it's back here. She's now in, 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 in Taiwan at DDM. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, and you still have your hair. It's, it's going to be a while. <laughs> yeah, could be, yes. Go ahead. So actually, uh, you address most of the question because Michael, because I want to follow Michael's question. Um, like recently, it's because I'm uh, in quarantine. So I'm practice um, just sitting. And then uh, the thing is, so when I relax right into sittings and then same all the thoughts pops up and so it starts to get tricky that whether these I'm following the thoughts or I'm using the method in the present moment um I will feel like what I'm doing here is that I right so I think you addressed most of it just now uh, but if you can elaborate more because um, yes. like after a while I start to get confused am I on the method or am I following my thoughts because the thoughts is very subtle it's going on all the time kind of. yeah there is there is a difference in uh, when you're sitting to meditate and I'll, I'll just use an example my fingers as thoughts percolating up coming up you know thought of what's going to happen tomorrow, thought of whether you're going to get into school, thought of this, what thought of that, whatever it is, you know, they're all coming up. 
things of the past, things of the future, they all come up. You don't have to drive them out of the mind. And, and that's where people get frustrated because they think that because they're meditating and because they're going to meditate, that the thoughts are going to stop. They're not going to stop. You put them there. They're naturally there. It's okay because, again, like you can look at it from the viewpoint of what I was saying to, to Michael, you're looking right into mine. It's like a cross section. Boom. In that moment, what is arising in mind? You have thoughts that have arisen and are fading away, thoughts that are percolating up and are just simply thought bubbles, and then thoughts that are there. But the a depth practitioner just observes all of that without moving the eye towards any of the thoughts. It is when one engages the thought that one is off the method. But you have to become adept to letting them coming up. Just letting them coming up, letting them coming up. And, and you, you remember the story of uh, Sariputra when the, when the goddess uh, rained flowers on, on all of the bodhisattvas, right? And, and Sariputra looked and he looked like a parade float because all of the flower petals were stuck to him. And he would not have been good at sun illumination because he still had this idea that these, you know, were either good or bad, or he shouldn't have this adornment on his robe. So his mind moved. But if you become um, adept at just allowing the thoughts to come through, understanding this is the self nature of mind, they're naturally going to come up. So we don't have to purge the, the mind from the sentient side and say, I don't want to have anything pertaining to um, Ling Yun coming up in my mind. That's bad. No, Ling Yun's going to come up. It's naturally going to come up, but you don't have to chase it out or you don't have to chase towards it or turn your eye towards it. You become aware. So as you're sitting there, as you're beginning to sit um, and let's say uh, using as an a little higher level of inducement, you're there and you become aware of the room in a 360 viewpoint, aware of what's behind you, aware of what's in front, aware of everything, but just using awareness, not judging it, it's hot, it's cold, whatever, you, it is what it is. And then as the thoughts begin to arise, just they are part of the environment so you just allow them to pass through and that's all they're going to do is they're going to pass through when you become adept at side illumination they will just simply pass through that's why i was saying because you you have this lengthy stay there you know where you're in isolation you can use it like a big one you know solitary retreat and if you get this right this is what I was trying to tell you the other night. If you get this right, you can make uh, a lot of progress just simply being in your room and meditating and just allowing the things to flow by. They just flow by. You know, some of them are fading. Some of them are strong. Some of them are coming up. They're percolating and, and they're coming up. And then some just stay there. It doesn't matter. They will eventually move. Some of them have more force than others. Others could be just a sensation, a tickle or whatever. Others could be something that's a problem in your life. And it just wants to just do this to you. It just wants to take center stage. But you just let it go. It has nothing to do. Just sitting. Just sitting. When you understand that, then it will work. It will work. You, you've got to do that though you you really have to to stay at it and and don't take these sometimes i talk about it it's like a like a um a thought smorgasbord a thought buffet of different kinds of stuff oh look you know there's some fruit here there's some cheese here you know here's an egg roll here's this you know whatever comes up that will titillate your senses it's it's offering itself to you look at me look at me you know you really need to look at me because you have a big problem 
And you go, what? Now you've got a big problem because you're off your method. But you don't look at it. It just goes away. It doesn't matter whatever it is. Let it go away. It's, it, it is just like, like um, Shakyamuni Buddha, you know, when Mara was tempting him with all sorts of different things, trying to tempt them with fear and for lust, for greed, whatever. And, and all of these things are coming up, but they have nothing to do with just sitting. So you just simply, you're sitting there with this noble conviction because you have a noble mind. You're using the Buddha mind. You're not using the mind of Lin Yu. So you sit with this nobility to, to rise above all of these different appearances that are coming and going and coming and going. It doesn't matter. Just let them go. No matter what happens in this lifetime, the worst thing that's going to happen is you're going to come back again. And, you'll, and because of your practice in this lifetime, you'll be better. So it's, it's okay. You know, you don't have to get it all right or you didn't have to get it all right. You didn't have to make all of the best decisions. It is what it is. So it's okay. So you don't get tempted by these things that want to get you. They're like hobgoblins that come up in your mind to scare you. And, and just let them go by. Let them go by. Let them go by. It doesn't matter. Don't ever think how long I've been sitting. How long will I sit? Or I'm sitting really, really good. Thank you, thank you. I'm doing such a good job. Never think in this way. Just sit, okay? Just sit. And if you're going to remember anything, just hear my voice. Just say, just sit. Sit, sit, okay? Hopefully that helped you. Thank you, thank you, Joe. You're welcome. Yes, Vadim. Uh, hi, Gilbert. Uh, thank you for today's lecture. Um, uh, the question that came up is about uh, karmic obstructions. Uh, I think I read um, uh, Shifu saying that when he was starting to meditate, somebody told him that he just has uh, too heavy karmic obstructions and he can't meditate. He has to do prostrations first. So uh, I was uh, sort of trying to figure out what my karmic obstructions should be in that case. Uh, and uh, it feels like, well, maybe um, uh, that means that uh, if your karmic obstructions are heavy, you're going to get everything you hear wrong. You're going to get the method wrong. And maybe there is, uh, first you should uh, clean them up and then only you, you can proceed to using the method. And if that is the case, uh, what could be the method of cleaning uh, karmic obstructions apart from uh, the method? When you, um, they, they have a saying saying that you, you don't put a new wine in, in an old barrel, you have to clean it first. But when you clean the barrel, you don't just pick on one area to clean. You just clean the whole barrel. And so if you feel you have karmic obstructions, you don't have to worry about from where do they come from. Um, it's like the parable of, of the arrow being shot in the air and wounding the person. The person shouldn't think about where did the arrow come from? They should only think about uh, how can they get well? And so when you do your uh, repentance, your shame and repentance, you can you can do your shame and repentance, but you don't have to, to self-flagellate, whip yourself with it. Just simply try to clean the barrel of all this and transfer merit to those that you've harmed in the past, those you may harm in the, in the present, those who you may harm in, in the future. And you just, to all sentient beings, and, and in this way, then you, you have a clean disposition to be able to sit. It does work. It will work. And so you have to just be very sincere about the practice and sincere that you've caused harm to people in the past, you know, um, unless there's somebody that's a, a, an extreme, um, I mean, highest level bodhisattva or an angel of the 10th degree. Um, most people have caused harm to others. 
sometimes intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. So we all have something to be able to uh, uh, um, to repent and, and develop shame. Once we do the shame and repentance, then we can sit and practice well. And you should incorporate that also in your daily life and your daily practice. Uh, it helps, you know, keep you kind of honest because you look at yourself and go, oh, I'm not too happy with this guy called Gilbert, you know, because he's done this or he's doing this or whatever. And so you try to keep yourself honest by doing that. And it will help you in your in your meditation practice tremendously. OK, so I do recommend you do that. OK. OK, Lewis. Uh, thank you, Gilbert, for the, the lecture. I really enjoyed it. Um, but m my question is, uh, what's the relationship between uh, meditation, the method, and chi? Because I can sense chi when I'm doing tai chi or qigong, but when I'm doing meditation, it seems like there's an absence of that sensation chi. Well, qigong means working with chi chan just means practicing we're not talking about chi we're not talking about any kind of a um an, an experience um so you just put that out of your mind it has nothing to do with the practice if you're doing that then you're practicing qigong not not uh chan qi, qigong has its its purposes and its ways um uh, but it cannot um, produce the highest wisdom that Chan can. And that's why, that's why I practice, um, uh, Chan rather than Qigong, you know, um, I can do it, but I, I, my practice is, is, is Chan and delivering people. And, uh, so, so don't pay any attention to the chi in your body whatsoever. That's a very common thing for people making a transition from, from qigong to to um, uh, to chan meditation, there, you don't pay any attention to the body whatsoever. You just park the body. What Shifu says: give the body to the cushion, and and then the mind to the method, and do it in this way. So there's no room there that you could say um, uh, that as at all. Okay, there's no there's nothing where you say okay, there's chi here. So if you're doing the chi thing, then then you're 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 um, really stifling um, the method, the Chan method. Okay. Um, I, I have uh, uh, one other question, and it's just related. It has to do with uh, um, relaxation before, and what I I found was with uh, with. Qigong and Tai Chi that it stimulated the relaxation as something before doing um, meditation or before the method. Now, you can do that if you want to if you want to do it again, like I said, that they both have their inducements um, to to work with the chi and stuff. But um, you know, you it depends on what kind of qi gong that you're using, you know. Certain qigong, um, the ones that you're used to, um, are very common. Others, like ne gong, um, they would not be advisable. So, um, if you want to learn ne gong, five dollars, please. Um, but, um, but that's, uh, you know, I don't think that you're 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 used to practicing that or or, or familiar with that. But the, the qigong is, is fine. You can do that and, and then sit and, and that's fine. It's just like the yoga exercises. They, they will help you to, to loosen your body. So when you sit, you'll be, you'll be relaxed. So I, either one, Tai Chi Chuan or, or, uh, or qigong will do that. Okay. Thank you, Gilbert. Okay. Next. Why? There you are. Hello, Yunkai. Are you there? there oh, you yes, are. I'm here. Sorry, okay. I didn't realize that it's me. <laughs> um, so talk about the silent illumination. 
so, uh, well, you, you're talking about let the uh, using the fingers as a, like an example, and let the thoughts just arise. Um, so, my experience is that when uh, when I aware of the thought, it stops, and uh, sometimes I. Uh, I'm a little confused. Um, I'm not sure if it's because there was a uh, even subtler thought indicating me that I want to stop the thought. You can do that. I, I mean, that's part of the thing of, of doing that. It, it's kind of um, like having um, training wheels on a bicycle that you you are reminding yourself to disengage and that's okay. Uh, you can do that until you become steady and stabilized in the method. So you, you have the thought to let go of the thought. You, you use whatever works for you in whatever language you want, but you could just simply just go, let go, let go. And, and, and then what that means to you it's not a thought, a sequential thought where you're saying, let go, you know, I see you, you're this, and this, and this. You just say, let go, because it's a universal let go. It applies to anything that begins to stick in the mind. So if you have a thought coming up, a family issue or whatever, and it's there and you just go, let go, and then it dissipates it. You, you're, you're cutting it off, but you, you're not banishing it from the mind you're cutting off the the habitual pattern of looking at it and and after a while you don't have to even bring up the word let go anymore you have, just have the thought let go and then eventually you won't have to use it at all but in the beginning it's not bad to have training wheels that so you can you can practice to to let go of the thoughts so um it isn't necessarily bad it's it's what I would call poison, you know, uh, killing poison and, and essentially, but because it, it's only this one thought of let go and, and it's a repetitive one. So it, it will not have uh, too much of a damaging effect there unless you're, you just turn it into a mantra, let go, let go, let go. Okay. Okay. So you're fine. You'll, okay. you'll be okay with that. You know, the thing is the, to all of you, the consciousness and the illusory ego is very, very clever. It will come up in, in ways uh, through the back door to try to trick you. You know, it may say, Gilbert, you're doing a really good job. You know, you haven't had a thought for a long time. You know, no wonder you're, you know, people like to listen to you. you just, let go, let go, you know, because they, it's sneaking in. So there's very, very ways that that happens. If you cannot catch those ego uh, suggestions coming up in meditation, how can you catch them in your everyday life? So when our practice is to catch these so that they do not affect us in our everyday life, we are aware of them. Because what we're doing is we're practicing mind awareness. Okay, It's not dual. It's different than dual. It's mind awareness just in this present moment. Of course, the present moment, we call it the present moment, but the present moment is limitless. But it's just how mind works. If we're going to tune to mind, we have to tune into the right station. We cannot tune into the cogitation station. It's not, it, 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 we cannot adjust the dial to be able to tune in that frequency. So we have to tune into the frequency of mind itself. Okay, and if you're not, if you're still in the samsaric one, you're never going to get it. Okay. So any other? Go ahead. All right. So if if the self sneak in, it should always be in uh, the uh, the format of a thought, which is in language. Is it like in in words and language? No, it, it can sneak in in different ways to you. It, it, it can sneak in. Um, and the most insidious ideas of the self are not verbal, 
or I should say um, like thought verbal, you know, um, they are uh, like a desire, um, a craving or something, an impatience that comes up. And, the, and so the impatience, this emotion, which pertains to the ego will come up and it's like a heat seeking missile. It's looking for something to attach to. You'll never get this or you're never going to get ahead in your job. You're never going to do this. You're never going to get it. It's there looking for something to attach to. And so it's searching through, through the anywhere can find something. And then suggestions will come up and say, take me, take me, you know, I'm a good one. And, and so, so be very mindful of emotions. Emotions are also a form of, of a cogitation, but they're looking for a dance partner. I don't know if that makes any sense to you. They're looking for something to attach to, but they in themselves, because of the habitual energy, like hatred or anger, you're looking for something to be angry about. Oh, my pen just ran out of ink. I can't stand that, you know, or whatever it is. And you go, where did that come from? Well, the anger was floating around waiting for something to attach to. And so as soon as it found something, it just amplifies it and makes it something stronger. So as we begin to understand the clarity of the mind, we see how the mind moves towards objects or senses something that is moving kind of like um, um, a black hole. Uh, the astronomers, they see like stars moving towards something. There's nothing there, but they see things moving towards it. And, and emotions are like black holes. They're, they're looking for something and they're drawing things to, to get close to them. So we have to be very, very careful that we, we, don't, um, we don't fall into these emotional traps of desire, of greed, whatever it is, the things that are there, I'm not happy, I'm what, whatever, you know, that come up. And um, so you, you have to be careful about that. That is the clarity of the mind that enables us to see that as well, okay? So a Thank lot you. of times in the sun illumination and going back to Michael and, and Ling Yun, be be watchful for the emotions there there are these like black holes that'll draw that draw um uh images or thoughts to them you know so we have that's why we have to rest in the present moment resting means that we're resting from from um the uh, any kind of sentient emotions that arise okay and you know if you're a um a card carrying sentient being you have a lot of emotions that you carry around with you at any given time so um you know be be careful with that as well okay any last questions no well we went over time um but I, oh okay what all right you just barely made it in go hey, ahead i have a simple question uh i, I don't dare to go to the silent illumination Yes, I know I, I, I am not silent, but I need to do the breathing. Uh, with that, I, I just want to check. I, I uh, calm my body first, like uh, scanning, then do the breathing. Uh, so is that correct? Yeah, we, we don't, we just simply observe the breath. We don't try to control it. So we don't, or and let's say if you were counting the breath, you know, One, and you're trying to control it. You're just watching the breath. Just watch it. The, there's one sutra that talks about that. It says, I'm observing taking a long breath. I'm observing taking a short breath. Because it just simply whatever the body wants to do in, in breathing, you're in the present moment. And you're just watching the breath. So it's, it's, it's a very, very simple um, method which will segue into sun illumination eventually so you don't have to worry about going into sun illumination it, it will go into you okay at some point in time just do the breathing right just observing the breath you know what are you going to observe can you see your breath <sighs> did you see the breath no i mean it's kind of weird right 
you're observing the breath. So you're just observing the cycle of the breath. Okay. okay. Thank you. You'll be fine. You'll do good. Okay. We'll finish up. We'll continue on. I think we're going to keep riding this ride because I'm using it again um, to um, present uh, meditation and how, how all this applies to meditation so that you don't think this is just some kind of a scholarly exercise. Uh, it has to pertain and come back to meditation because we're Chan practitioners. So, so I want to emphasize that at this point and show you how, how the evolution of the Chan practice was and how now you know there's a tension here as to how to how to do the the practice okay so bring your questions if you have questions about how to meditate um any kind of question it doesn't there's no uh on point one whatever question you have about meditation and your difficulty